Hello, everybody, and thanks for having me here today to deliver you this introduction to Azure Machine Learning. Thanks a lot to the ADCD team, uh, Tony, Martina, and all the collaborators. Thank you so much for having me here. Today, we are going to talk about Azure Machine Learning. Today, today's world is hard to find the hottest work uh, than data science and machine learning. It's a fast growing field that's uh, reshaping the world as we live in. It's incredible how these things are evolving and we are having today in our computers, in our uh, mobile devices and other devices and computing in the edge, computing power, which is incredible. And later on, it's mimicking the intelligence of humans, which uh, so far away in time, that was really just imagination and science fiction. That's pretty cool. Such a fast moving field. We have to update. If we want to run that on our computers, we have to update our hardware and software uh, like uh, every two or three weeks or every month or two months, because this is really evolving like crazy in hardware and software, install drivers, install and configure. And well, it's really crazy. Azure Machine Learning provides exactly a solution for that. A ready self-made environment to do everything you need in data science. And that's and it does not fall short on that. Uh, it does also to a level which is impossible with your home computer or even all your home computing power capabilities together. I myself got a computer for AI machine learning back in early 2016. All right, this one. I got like uh, three screens to work comfortable with at the what moment was a machine learning studio. Now we call it the classic, which is going to be retiring in 2024. That was the predecessor of what I'm going to show you today. And that on the right side is, yeah, my cat, Whitey, cute, right? So this is Azure Machine Learning. And in this session, I will introduce you to how you can leverage the power of the cloud, of the Azure cloud to boost your data science powers, how to get started. Basically, my promise to you is that at the end of this session, you will understand what Azure Machine Learning is, how does it work, how it integrates with Azure, its main components, and how you can create a model with it using its three different flavors, the designer, AutoML, and the notebook experience. Are you in? Let's get started. My name is Jose Luis Latorre. My Twitter ID is G-O-S-L-A-T from the third first letters of my name and first third letters of my last name. My GitHub is slash G-O-S-L-A-T as well. I work as a software architect and developer community lead at Swiss Live. So I lead the developer community and organize now things like a hackathon. <laughs> and yeah, as well as I'm a Microsoft MPP and I co-lead with other friends, the .NET user group of Zurich together. Again, it's a pleasure to be in the Austin Developer Community Day, and thanks to all the sponsors, Microsoft AdWords, Cololux, Tieto, Vic, I don't know how to pronounce that, and all the rest. So it's a pleasure. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Martina. Today, we are going to take a look at, first, we will do a bit of a refresher of AI, because the audience, I expect to be data scientists, but also developers wanting to start getting started with Azure Machine Learning. So. We will be doing a quick refresher that will be really quick, I promise. And then we will jump into Azure Machine Learning. I will explain the different components of it, how to get things done hands-on, and then how to create a model with a designer, with Auto Machine Learning, and the notebook experience. Last but not least, something which I believe it's important. I will introduce ONX, but more on that in a moment. First things first. AI. What is AI? AI is the ability of machines and software to mimic human behavior. And that started quite early in 1950, which is when essentially we could start coding. Then comes machine learning a bit later. Machine learning is the ability of machines to learn. That's awesome. And make predictions based on its experience, which for computers, it's data. That appeared trend appear in 1980, which is pretty cool. And then some years later, few in this case, we 
get to see something called deep learning. Sounds awesome, but essentially it's very simple. It's the ability of machine to learn mimicking the human brain structure. Essentially, they learn how to set up the different layers of artificial neural, neural, neural neural networks, sorry. And yeah, they essentially mimic the biological neuro, neuron. So it's um, a way of mimicking the brain structuring with the increasing computing power that we have today. And with GPUs, this is really, has reached an amazing level. So some years ago, humans were written at their own games like chess, then Go, that was a bit more complicated. Also in terms of vision recognition, and computers have beaten us at our own game on precision and also on speed. And there are other fields that are very specialized at the moment, but they are really beating us. How does machine learning work? Let's go back. We have a set of images that we add and train. We add labels. We train a model. And then when the model sees an image, it can recognize it. So let's see that again. We have data, we label it, we train the model, we deploy the model, model sees something, and it can infer or detect and, and say, what is that? Essentially, the machine learning algorithms that we can train are of three types. They are supervised and supervised, and we have regression. Supervised is when we have labels, when we label the data and it can learn by itself by analyzing the data and the result of the prediction they have to do. Usually we have two kinds, like a classification, like we saw before, we are classifying the types of flower and recognizing them by <clears throat> doing a prediction, which is a regression, um, which predicts an outcome based on historical data, for example, unsupervised, which just gets the data and it has to infer and determine um, some relation on the data, like a clustering and it does completely without any human interference. And reinforcement. Reinforcement learning is pretty, pretty cool. This is how computers have beaten us at a lot of games like Go and Chess, because we don't give it levels. We gave rules of what it can do, what it cannot do, and what is good and a bit of a kind of a scoring model. And then it simply plays or tries to determine the next action. And based on the actions and the score it gets, it uh, determines if the model is better or not. And then it can retrain itself and get better over time. And when you do that 10 or 20 times, you don't get too much improvement. But when you do that millions and millions of time, then you get a machine learning model that can be a world champion, which I believe it's pretty kind of amazing. Next, how do we get there? We have what we call the machine learning workflow that it can change depends on the platform a bit, but essentially is comprised of a training phase and a prediction phase. On the training phase, we usually feed some data and we do what we call the ETL, extract, transform, and load. Then we train the machine learning model. We select and deploy the model, and then we do what we call a prediction and inferencing when we feed it unknown data. And then we get a prediction results. In this case, we get the Bellis Perennis or a number if we are predicting a value. It's quite cool. And that's it about AI refresh. Then we go into Azure Machine Learning. From a Microsoft slide that I'm showing you, it essentially says to bring AI to everyone with an end-to-end -end scalable trusted platform. And that's quite true. It's really, really true. It's essentially it's going to boost your data science productivity, increase how you experiment and how you deploy and manage models everywhere. And it's built with the needs of a data scientist in mind to do automated machine learning, manage compute, simple deployment, and provide also developers for machine learning or MLOps, as it is called now. Also, it's supporting all the different or most of the open source frameworks, including a tool agnostic Python SDK, which is pretty good. And it's pretty integrated with Azure, as the previous one, Machine Learning Studio Classic, was not really. Azure Machine Learning has 
two flavors. For once, we have the front end, and for the part that you usually wouldn't work, we have the back end. The back end is called Azure Machine Learning Workspace, and we create that from within the Azure portal. Here on the Azure portal, we have an storage account, which is created for us when we create the workspace, the container registry to keep containers with the deployed models, the key vault for secrets and configurations that are security sensible, and Azure application insights for getting some logs and analytics and how everything is working and everything is managed by the workspace. It has some managed resources like computer instances or clusters to do machine learning at a scale. And then we have some link services that we can link data stores and compute targets. And then it enables us from the machine learning studio, the front end, the UI, to manage environments, experiments, pipelines, data sets, models, endpoints, and many more. This we will see in a moment. Then we have the front end, which is what we will usually work. We go to ml.azure.com, if I don't remember wrong. And then you have a set of Azure Cloud Services, the Python SDK, and a very nice UI to work with. That enables us to prepare data, build models, train models, manage the models, track experiments. In fact, we can track everything and deploy the models. One thing that usually is not mentioned is that Azure Machine Learning enables not just one person, you can enable one team to work together. Uh, that's pretty neat because uh, I think it's a few days ago they released um, some means that you can annotate the notebooks or the work from other colleagues. So it's pretty, pretty neat. So how do we get there? So let's take a look. So essentially, everything starts with Azure, this is the front part. I have already created a machine learning workspace, but how do you create is you click on create a resource, you can search for it. Machine learning, there we go, you have it, you click on create, you click Yeah, you select a resource group, which is like a kind of a logic aggregation for Azure. If you work with Azure, you probably know that already. We could put a nice workspace, seems to be not existing. And then you can select a region where you create it, and it provides, a, provides you some suggestions for a storage account names, key vault, application insight, and container registry. This is not mandatory, it's only if you deploy the models. And then you could check networking, some advanced, some tags, and click on review and create. And then if everything is good, you could click on create. I have already created one, so I'm, we are not going to do that. Uh, okay, yes. So let's take a look to it. I will collapse these parts. And here is essentially what we see in a normal Azure resource. This is a Azure Machine Learning Workspace. Here we could see the activity, we could define um, the permissions with uh, access control management, uh, create role assignments, add a role assignment or a administrator, assign users, and see a lot of things. This is more the administrative part of Azure Machine Learning. And usually we will not work with that. What we will do is we will launch the studio, which usually goes to ml.azure.com. I said it right. And here is what we see at the beginning. I have done already some, some tests. This is pretty brands and notifications in regards of this. So the experience is pretty similar to Azure portal. Let's take a look at one guided tour, which is pretty cool to, to show you a bit around it. Essentially, it's everything, it's like a tool set of everything you need to do data science. It enables you to register data, to store data on the portal, to track it with version, to train the models, 
to create different pipelines with the three flavors. We will see that, uh, evaluate the models, and then deploy the models. We have an authoring part, which is the notebook experience, automated ML, and the designer, a part that we can manage the assets we usually work with, like data sets or data structures that we can work to set, infer or to train a model. We can we have what we call experiments, which are executions of pipelines, which can be either to train a model, to do inference, or simply to process the data. So essentially, when we define a pipeline, either with a designer or notebooks, we can do this. We have the models, which are the models we have trained, and the endpoints. And last but not least, we have the compute, which is where we have our virtual machines that we have created and the environments, which are like an abstraction over compute that we can tell it like a, it was a container, a ready-made environment with a configuration. And that's very neat because we can exactly tell it how we want to work and what version of what framework we want installed. Data stores, data labeling, Data labeling is at the moment essentially for labeling images. I uh, think there is a preview for text, but I haven't checked that out. Uh, link services for external tools. And that's about it. And we are done with how to get there. This way, we end up with a fully working, a fully fledged working Azure machine learning. Then we will take a look at the Azure machine learning designer. This is a drag and drop interface to create pipelines for training models, inferencing, or data processing. That's pretty cool. This is what was on Azure Machine Learning Studio Classic. I really love that part. That's what I got the monitor I showed you before. This is the one which is in front of me. And um, so let's get a look to how to work with that. Before, I should, yeah, I have already some ready-made compute instances and clusters, but before we work with that, you should create a compute instance. Otherwise, it's the first thing it will tell you. You click on compute and create, you put it a name, the location is fixed, and then you can select the CPU or GPU. GPU is better for deep learning neural networks, GPU is the best. Then you have some recommended options. And then you can select from all the options. Just saying, usually in a normal account, you will have only 20 course quota, from six to 20. So you need to do a request for increasing that. In this case, I could select from all options. I could go with, oh yeah, let's do something cool. 16 cores, 32 or even 120 cores and click create for next advanced settings and configure the axis and click create. I'm not going to do that because I have already one leave stay. And for compute clusters, experience is essentially the same. You select the location in this case, dedicated CPU, GPU, select all options. If you want, of course, you could select this one. This is nice and click next. You should put the compute name. Select the number of nodes, which depends on your compute. You can go a bit higher or not. It was seconds before scaling down. So these nodes will simply uh, shut down and disappear. And then you could click on create. I'm not going to do that because I have already created and they take a bit to be created. Then coming back to the designer with everything we need to make it work now, we could click and create a new pipeline. The first thing is to select a compute instance to work. That's it. And then, um, well, again, uh, what I'm doing is I'm creating one completely from zero new pipeline. I'm not using one of the samples already made, which would be way too easy. So again, selecting the compute instance, I'm going to get a 
sample data set. I'm going to do some data transformation. So I want to select columns. I want to, this should be what we're calling the ETL, uh, select columns in that set, yes. And everything goes from top to bottom. You see the arrow, everything goes from top to bottom. Here I should configure on the right the panel. I will get all the columns for once, and then I will exclude one column. And I will take the normalized losses because we don't need that. And then I want to clean the data because if you take a look at the data, there's some elements that are not properly fulfilled. If you look at all the data, not the normalized losses, but all some values that are not fully informed. So I want to get rid of them. Then remove duplicate rows, partition, sample. Should go for C, 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 C. In, in data. Connect the dots. And then before editing the column, what I want is select the cleaning mode. In this case, if the row has any data, I will I want to remove it. Still wrong, so I have to add, select all the columns. Yes, that's it. Perfect. Now we are almost ready to train. What we would like to do is split the data. I think that's at the end, yes. And we connect the dots again. And here, as you remember, uh, we have label data. What we want to predict is, I'm showing you that, the price. So we get a lot of data from the car, and at the end, we want to predict this column, the price. And in some cases, we don't have it. So probably this column, we will remove it. That's one of the issues that we have in this data. And for this, we will select a partition of 0.7, which is kind of a 70%. So we will have 70% going to train and 30% for the validation part. We move that here. And now we are at the moment that we can select the data model, sorry, the machine learning model. So we open these machine learning algorithms. And as this is pretty simple data, this linear regression should do. We can configure, but we don't need to do that for this demo. That's on. We set the trade model that we will feed the model algorithm and the data for training. And we need only to tell it what is the label column. Label column is what we want to predict. In this case, it's the price. too big. Now we are almost done. Now we only need to score and evaluate the model. Okay, score comes first. I always confuse them both. So I will score the model from the data. So I will make it to predict um, the data that it has never seen with the model train, then evaluate it. Then we could submit it, and then an experiment will be created, or we could even select a new one. I would put and experiment and submit it. And this will start it. This can take a bit to start. Um, yeah, if we go to view run overview, uh, I really love the names it's giving. Headline parameters. We'll take a look at that in one moment. 
This part we can collapse already. If we go to the run overview, we can see what it is doing and see it live. But this takes a few minutes and we don't have the time. What we are going to do is we are going to take uh, to an eye to a previous pipeline that has already been executed, which is more or less exactly the same. So everything went green here. And on the clean missing data, for example, if we preview the data, you can see that from 200 something, we are in 193, but this data is clean. Then we get a model, we score it. So we could see that the model score, if we go to the right, we have like 58 rows. That's the training data, and these are the score levels. And this is the correct price. And on the evaluate model, we can see in the metrics, the use coefficient of determination, which is like a kind of how good is the model. And the closest to one is the best. So we could say that it's uh, yeah, about 86% of good on the 100% that it can be. This relative square error is a bit of the uh, sum of all the errors from the, the line of the trend from the linear regression that we are drawing. And it's pretty, pretty cool. So it's it tells a bit uh, how prone to error is your uh, machine trained machine learning model. And the closest to zero is the better. So these two are the ones to take a look at in this case. All right. So we are done with the machine learning designer. Now you know how to create a machine learning model with a machine learning designer. And we are going to take a look at what is automated machine learning. This is pretty, pretty cool. For me, this is my favorite feature on here. Essentially, it's using machine learning to do machine learning. It does a lot of what we have done now, which we went way too quick with the drag and drop. It does everything for us, and it does it a lot better than I did in a moment ago. It provides data guardrails, so it tells you when the data is off. So probably, as you guess, the data I show you, I knew it a bit. I play with it a bit, so I, I went already and implemented it more or less properly. So the data guardrails will tell you if you have any offset or wrong data that's not matching and will create problems at your model. Then selects the best model for you. And that means it tries different models. It does, after that, hyperparameter tuning to improve the models. And it, it will explain uh, the model for you, the best model. The, the model that the algorithm, the auto machine learning selects, it will explain it for you. You can, you can do that with the other models. So you can peek and look and, and create that without any problem. I can show you in a moment. And it tells you mostly the feature importance. So which of the different parts of the data you feed are more significant for reaching uh, outcome of doing the prediction. As well as super different tasks. At the moment, classification, regression, and time series. And essentially, it's a data scientist in a box. To me, it's the dream of an aficionado data scientist. <laughs> My work mostly consists in software engineering, Azure, and a bit of AI. So essentially, what it's doing is feature selection. Then it tries all the different models, sees which score the best, selects that, and then does some hyperparameter tuning to even further optimize it, and then gives you the best of the best, all completely automatically, which is pretty cool. Essentially, you only have to give it the data set, the target metric, and how much time do you give to your cluster to do the work, and then it will do the rest. It's pretty awesome. Then it will, at the end, finally give you a leatherboard with the models and the score of each model. And then you can explore even the first model or all the others if you want. So let's get that done. 
For auto machine learning, we go to automated ML. And we have a very nice button, new automated machine learning run, where we can select one of the data sets or create one. I think we're good in time. So I will could select one from I can put the name here. Okay, data store. I have to click next. This is where we will put, which is the work, the <clears throat> blob uh, storage that was created in the data store that was created when we created the workspace. And then we could browse the file and we select this bank marketing file. I will upload it. Uh, then it determines it. What is it? So it's everything is good. It's kind of an Excel import here with the ID, columns, comma, UTF-8. All columns have headers. And everything is correct. We don't import the path. And we end up with some data, which essentially is bank marketing data to determine if the end user or the potential customer buys the product and signs the contract or not. So we we'll select one of them. We could refresh and see the, the one that I added. So we could select that one. And then we should be able to configure the run. OK, we can create a new experiment for this. We have to tell it the target column, which is UI, which is a yes or no. We could consider that like a kind of a binary classification problem and select a complete cluster, which we can put on this one. And then I really like what it's doing. It's automatically detecting the kind of machine learning algorithm we want to train. In this case, everything is Supervised data classification, regression or time series forecasting. In this case, it's a classification because what we want to predict is a label. It's a yes or no, right? We could enable or not enable deep learning. And then let's do that here and then click or no. Apart from that, we could configure some additional steps like the metric we want to base on. Then additional classification, exit criterion, so we could tell instead of that, I want one hour to execute these and I could store thresholds. I could say, hey, if you reach a 90% accuracy, you are good enough. I will not do that. So I will give it one hour and then next. Um, yeah, that's perfectly fine. And that's everything we have to do. It's essentially give it the data, the label and next, 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 next. It's pretty, pretty awesome. This will take from 90 minutes to about 29 minutes. So we are not going to wait. And I'm going to open um, the pass experiment now. I really like the namings that they are given here to the runs, like a uh, gentle sail, knit helmet, uh, a fable spoon. I love it, polite lemon. So let's open this experiment. Perfect, good. So, here we have a bit of the different accuracy. We reach in 95%, also 94%. So the, uh, the different ways of scoring are really nice. Here we have one run, but really what is it doing behind the scenes is, is really amazing. It somewhere canceled because it reached a point where it could not do uh, improve on its own. So automatically cancels all the runs if he thinks he is not going to be able to improve. And it does a lot of tests for us. So at the moment, we will only remove the child runs that are triggered by the main one. And here we have the algorithm that was selected. If we click on the experiment on the run, we will see it's completed. 
there were some issues with the detector rails that maybe we should check and it could not fix on its own. But the, even with that, the, the result is not that bad. So we get an AOC weighted of 94. So it's pretty close to one. So really, really nice. And it uh, was using the end. Um, if we look at the models, this is like uh, using two models in one. This is what we call an ensemble, which is one of the techniques used in machine learning competitions. So it really reaches a very high level. So if we go to models, this is essentially an ensemble. And the cool thing is that we can view an explanation. If you don't see that, you can click on explain the model. And this really shows you the different features, performance. But I think this visualization is the nice, nicest one. Here, we can see that duration has the biggest impact in if the customer will sign the contract or not, and see employed as well. And if the variability rate and some kind of index, we can even increase it to see other factors. Like for example, the Uribor can also is really, really affecting this decision. So maybe if the bank sees this information, they could say, oh, well, we may invite to a coffee or a coffee and a cookie, and then they will be at least five or 10 minutes more to eat that, right? So that's that's pretty cool. And you can even take out actionables for doing that. So here we, out of nothing, implemented a model that reached about 95% accuracy in a prediction. How cool is that? All right. So now what we have left is to take a look to the notebook experience. So let's do just that. If we go to notebooks, this is what you see. Um, so you see some files and samples. You could, I think, create a new. You can also create a notebook from here. But usually, if you have created already something, this is what you see. What we are going now is we are going to take a look at one of the ready-made models or pipelines in this uh, IPINB, which stands for Interactive Python Notebook. And we get it from the samples. So I'm showing that. So you can do that as well if you are curious. So the one I'm doing is here on the tutorials, New York Taxi Data concretely from Manhattan. Here, what you do is you click and you can clone this notebook and it will create on your folder or a folder that you give. You could create a different folder and then you can click on clone. I'm not going to do that because I already did. So I'm going back and I'm opening it. That's it, I can collapse this and this so we have a bit more space. I'm going to make it a bit bigger so you can read it better and yeah, let me show the comments. Perfect. All right. So here, this is what we called the notebook experience. But in fact, it's essentially Jupyter notebooks. There's something that usually all data scientists and machine learning, even aficionados or beginners know about, because it's usually how they work, which is what we call declarative computing. This is essentially uh, like a kind of paper that we can create different blocks and the blocks can be markdown or code. Markdown, if we click, um, or we block usually later in this day and age, almost everybody blocks in markdown, or at least developers do. And, and then you can edit, create a documentation, explain what you're going to do, and then you can add code. And the code in this case is Python. You can do that in Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code uh, with different languages like C Sharp, SQL, etc. But in Jupyter Notebooks, this is Python and Markdown. Here, I have already executed everything. I'm importing the libraries like Pandas, for example, some other tools I need. I'm importing the green taxi data set from New York, clearly from this URL. 
And I'm adding that to this data frame. And I'm looking at the first 10, which is way too much information. I don't need the information or all of it. So I'm removing uh, some columns that I don't need and popping them out and showing that until the columns that make sense are good. Then I describe it. This is a bit what we did before to take a look at the quality of the data and the distribution. And we can see that there are some outliers. This, for example, would have been detected by the data carrels. We have in a trip distance, one which is 154. That's supposed to be in Manhattan. So we should be careful with that. And we have even um, passenger count of zero, which should not be in the case. So I'm removing that and checking that longitude and latitude is inside Manhattan and checking that the trip distance is under 31 miles, which is the longitudinal uh, distance of Manhattan. And I get a lot better data. I configure the workspace to work on it from the notebook, which is the same in code as what we were doing. We are telling, okay, I want to work with the machine learning workspace, Azure machine learning workspace. And we are splitting the data for training and configuring the automated machine learning. So the same that we did, the timeout in hours, at least stopping through and configuring that. And I'm simply training the model, which takes quite a bit here as well. At the end, we get similar that we got from AutoML, but honestly, in um, the notebook experience, you can do absolutely anything. You can clean data, you can create a pipeline for training a model or for inference or for simply training the data or doing whatever you would like to do. At the end, it ends up with this model and with this metric, which as you know, by this moment is kind of the closest to one, the better. So it's a, like a kind of 95%. For example, and then we uh, execute and retrieve the best model. With the best model, we are simply going to do a bit of a prediction. And with this prediction, we are getting some square errors, which is a bit high, but that's what it is. And then finally, we get all the results together and determine the model accuracy in this case. At the end, it's important to clean up the resources. And you can do that in two ways. Usually, what I do is I go to the compute, I click and I stop. Otherwise, you will keep big charge for, for these, the compute instances. Other than that, you could also delete them after you have finished your runs and as well as the clusters. So I recommend the clusters will run down. So it's the same as a stop. They will stop automatically. But bear in mind, these are virtual machines. You will be charged by the disk space that they use. So it's a good practice to delete them when you are not using to remove and avoid costs. I will do that later. So coming back, we have seen what is Azure Machine Learning, how to create a workspace and the uh, UI part. And now um, I'd like to talk to you about what is ONX. ONX stands for Open Neural Network Exchange. And that's the, the new standard, essentially, where you will want to deploy your models at. Now, lately, all the different um, machine learning tools are supporting these. The, the open source framework, like Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, everything is supporting ONX. ML.NET, for example, in, in .NET is a very known library in .NET for using and working with machine learning, can create uh, ONX. So they're a library to generate your ONX and to use that. And from Azure Machine Learning, you can create ONX as well. At the moment, I believe this is only possible with a notebook, but who knows in the future. And it is being supported by absolutely everybody. And it's pretty cool. So you have almost all your deep learning and machine learning frameworks and tools that can export and import this machine learning fr framework um, and generate uh, ONX. This is, uh, to say, a project created by Microsoft and uh, I would say 
Facebook and now it's Meta and other companies as well that join the fun. And uh, ONX model, you can use it absolutely anywhere in your computer, in your mobile device, in any other device that you can think of. And I believe you can even deploy it to uh, in computing in the edge. And essentially ONX has a way that it will reduce its uh, precision and adapt to the platform it's been run. Uh, that's pretty well made and it's really fairly easy to use. So if you do anything in machine learning, I recommend that you try to finally generate or even maybe reuse uh, ONX model. That's it, we are done. And I like to take some takeaways with you. The first one is that Azure Machine Learning rocks. It has everything we need, everything to do machine learning, to train a model, to do an inferencing pipeline or a prediction pipeline, to deploy and manage the model and do machine learning at the scale. The designer, uh, auto machine learning or auto ML, the notebooks are really cool. You've seen them work. They are really easy to work with and it supports ONX already. So it's feature proof in my opinion. And as well, the best is you try it for yourself. These, uh, Demos I show, you can find them on Microsoft documentation. And also I give you some, some links here. I will upload after this talk, the slides where you have the link. And there is in Microsoft Learn, is Microsoft certified Azure Data Science Associate, the complete curricula, if you want to go already in the certification path, or these two other paths, which are as a path of the first one, are also pretty cool and easy. These AI fundamentals, this exploration, visual tools for machine learning is more meant for easy and low code machine learning, the designer, AutoML, it's just three hours and build and operate machine learning solution. It's a kind of a longer path about 10 hours, but it's pretty cool and shows almost everything you can do in Azure machine learning. That's it. I'm open for questions and thank you very much again. Thank you. Tony, thank you, Martina. It's a pleasure to be here on the Austin Developer Community Day. Thank, thank you, Jose, for the session. And I'm just checking if there are any questions. Um, currently,